most psychological disorders can be treated, especially if they are addressed early on. Today we will cover some major psychotherapeutic interventions or treatments for psychological disorders. The earliest intervention practiced by modern psychologists was psychoanalysis or psychodynamic psychotherapy as it has come to be called recently. In psychodynamic psychotherapy, it is assumed that many problems in our childhood, many suppressed wishes and desires from our early childhood are carried on into our adulthood. We are usually not conscious of them, but they make us do things and they make us do things that we have no control over. And psychodynamic psychotherapy proposes to address those hidden or repressed wishes and desires of our childhood. Psychodynamic psychotherapy assumes that most of our behavior, which we think is in our control, is in fact controlled by our unconscious desires, is in fact controlled by our unconscious mind. This unconscious mind is a part of the psyche which is made up of these hidden wishes and desires. These hidden things that we keep hidden even from ourselves because these wishes or desires can be too bad or too vulgar or too obscene for us to acknowledge. Sigmund Freud proposes that many of us find normal and healthy expression of these desires. So for instance, he would say that somebody writing a love poem, some painter painting a work of art, some architect producing an amazing building, some singer singing a love song, are all healthy and normal expressions of these hidden wishes. Sigmund Freud argues that most works of art are in fact expressions of these hidden desires and this process of converting these hidden desires and wishes to works of art is called sublimation. But there are many other processes that according to Freud cause disruption in our lives. So for instance, we as children felt very, very excited about something and our parents did not like it. They said things like, those who laugh will have cause for grief. Shut up, be quiet, control yourself, show proper behavior, do not show this overexcitement. So as a result, this excitement was suppressed. Now every time we should be excited about something, we in fact start to feel anxious. So the psychoanalytic or the psychodynamic therapeutic approach actually requires your patient to come in, talk to you about your problems, and the psychologist interprets how your unconscious mind is causing these problems. And once you understand these problems, these problems go away. This was a very popular model for nearly a hundred years. But there were several problems with this model. One of them was time. A typical psychoanalytic treatment required at least two to three years. And in some cases, five to seven years were required for successful treatment. Another approach that competed against psychodynamic or psychoanalytic therapy was behavior therapy. In behavior therapy, the idea was that people have learned undesirable behavior, they can be made to unlearn this behavior and they can be taught new behaviors in its place. So for instance, somebody who's afraid of snakes, usually it's a normal thing, you're afraid of snakes. But what if you're employed in a biology laboratory where you have to work with snakes and you have this fear? How do we treat that? This case would be called a phobia or an irrational fear of snakes. You know that these snakes can't harm you because there are so many protective measures there and you are wearing certain kinds of gloves and there are all kinds of antidotes available in the case of bite and so on and so forth. But still, it gives you the creeps every time you look at a snake. What the behaviorists would do is, first they would make you relax. They would make you calm by inducing relaxation. In many cases, Hypnosis was used. We'll talk about hypnosis in a different lecture. But for now, it is important to understand that relaxation was induced. People were made to relax first. Then imagery was used. Before people could even go and physically look at a snake, 
they were asked to imagine looking at a snake. And once they did that successfully without getting disturbed, the imagery was made more and more graphic and more and more close to the real phenomena. Then they were maybe asked to imagine touching the snake. They were maybe asked to imagine holding the snake in their hand with the snake moving and slithering in their hand. Once they expressed a high level of comfort working with snakes, they were then taken to the real life exposure situation. A lot of the time, psychologists would be accompanying the person and helping them. And this was called in vivo intervention. So in the cognitive approach, what one would do is, in fact, encourage the client to look at their self-talk, to the thoughts that they were experiencing behind that avoidance, behind that irrational fear, behind that phobia of snakes. They were saying things to themselves like, I won't be able to bear touching the snake. I won't be able to look at the snake. And if I looked at it, I would be very, very afraid. And this fear would be intolerable for me, unbearable for me. And I, since I won't be able to bear it, I might experience a heart attack or I might experience some tragedy or some serious catastrophe would result as a result of my touching the snake or going close to it. Another interesting thing about this self-talk was that there was a lot of fear of the fear itself. So not only were these people afraid of facing a snake, they were afraid of facing the fear of the snake. So fear of the fear reinforced their phobia. So the cognitive behavior therapy intervened not just at the behavioral level, but also at the cognitive level, at the level of the thought and the results were amazing. It was found that not only were there quick results, just like in behavior therapy, but also these results were relatively permanent, that the people were successful in defeating their phobias over the long term. Occasionally, it was considered a good idea to go for a booster, maybe every six months or every year, once the treatment lasting from six sessions to 12 session was completed. So cognitive behavior therapy was a turning point. I would like to caution, however, that cognitive behavior therapy, despite its successes and despite the huge research evidence base that they have in support of this treatment, it is still not a panacea. It is not an answer to all our difficulties and all our emotional disorders. There are many cases that require long-term psychodynamic psychotherapy to help resolve these difficulties. Over the years, people have also developed short-term psychodynamic treatment models such as brief psychodynamic therapy. There are also other more postmodernist therapies that are beyond the scope of this lecture. But it might be a good idea for psychology students to be aware that there's a very, very large number of psychotherapies out there and each one seems to have its merits.